I don't tend to make a big deal out of things. When I was a kid, my history teacher called me a tea speaker. I didn't know what that meant, so later at home, I looked it up to see if it meant reserved or little talker. This is still true to this day. In fact, at work, I am known, or rather was known, as Laconic Lewis because my name is Lewis Porter. Why the surname for a first name? My dear departed mother was partial to the actor Kevin Weasley, so she decided she wanted to name me after him. My father didn't really like the name Kevin, and my mother didn't like the name of the character he played on the detective series Morse, Robbie. So, they came to a compromise and named me Lewis, since the detective he played was named Robert Robbie Lewis. I had a degree in business administration, and my first job was at Arthur Long Associates, where I worked with the eponymous Arthur Long, who had founded the company 30 years earlier. While I couldn't be described as his right-hand man, I certainly had a place in the upper echelon of his management team. After working there for three years, I met Penny Lane, who worked in the marketing department. Yes, her father Arnold Lane was a Beatles fanatic and, at least in my opinion, a bit of an idiot. We became friends, fell in love, and got married. We bought a three-bedroom apartment in a pretty decent neighborhood in our town, not far from our company's office. While Penny wasn't my first girlfriend, she was the first woman I felt comfortable being frank with. Unspoken? Yes, I guess it's shyness looking back on my life. We had many late-night conversations discussing having children and considering buying a detached four-bedroom house in an up-and-coming neighborhood in the city. I still loved Penny, of course, but as it turned out, Penny no longer loved me, or did she love me at all? But she didn't have the decency to tell me. How did I find out? I'll tell you. Arthur had always had a vested interest in the company, attending trade shows from the early days when he pretended to be a visitor and wandered around the shows, meeting people, making business contacts, and avoiding ejection by security. Today, Arthur Long Associates often sponsored trade shows. There was talk of a new exhibition in Cardiff, the capital of Wales, that he wanted to attend. So he asked me to visit the venue, talk to the organizers, and meet the Welsh government's business development officer. In fact, the latter meeting was cancelled at short notice because he was called to a meeting at the Welsh government office in Holyhead, which is on the other side of Wales at the top. As a result, I packed my bags, checked out of the hotel a day early, and was soon on my way to our home in the English county. I sent Penny a text message saying I had a change of plans but didn't know if she had read it. Back at the office, I went into the room where presentation materials and equipment were stored to put some things away, and while I was there, I found out that my marriage had been over for a while, but no one had bothered to inform me. The storage facility was a large basement room set up like a warehouse with different areas for storing various display materials, from flyers to stands, which were arranged in an alphanumeric system. As luck would have it, I found myself at the far end of the room, around the corner in the Z9 area. Shortly after me, two of my co-workers walked in. They were in ILA too. They started talking, and their words drew me in. Because of the emptiness of the room, the sound of their voices came through very well. Have you heard anything more about Penny Porter and that a Dave Rogers? No, what happened? Turns out Dave was supposed to go to Cardiff to check out the new trade show at the Motor Point Arena in Cardiff, but he met Arthur and said, why not send Porter? That way, he won't get in the way of what I have in mind. No bloody way. Was he that brazen? The insolent bastard. I don't know why Arthur put up with it. He must have known Dave meant Penny. Lewis needed a good look. It's all about nepotism, really. You see, Dave has something poor Lewis will never have, Dave's mom is Arthur's little sister, so he gets away with all kinds of s that no one else does. Yeah, that makes sense. Explains why Dave's life is obviously glamorized. I feel sorry for Lewis. Poor guy's done a great job for Arthur for years, and as a reward, instead of the board seat he could have hoped for, Arthur sends him on a wild goose chase, letting his damn nephew sleep with Lewis's mistress. And that's wrong, isn't it? Well, no, no. I've thought of ways to warn him anonymously, but it's not easy. I can't let it get out to Arthur, or I'll lose my job. 
And given the bloody mortgage we're burdened with and the university fees for our two children, I just can't risk it. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'm in the same boat. I really am. Pass me that box, please. Ta. They've been at it for months at least, and Lewis hasn't noticed, or at least hasn't done anything about it. Maybe he knows but either doesn't mind or, like everyone else here, is afraid to tell. After all, as you said, there are rumors that Arthur is thinking of putting Lewis on the board, so rocking the boat now wouldn't be the best thing to do. No, probably not. Who knows? His wife is having an affair. Pretty much everyone in the company, everyone who matters, certainly the entire sea level management staff, probably a few others too. Maybe. Well, you know how rumors spread. Anyway, is it true that Penny intends to divorce that troublemaker and marry Dave? That's what I've heard. I don't know if it's 100% true, though. They left the room, finishing their job of doing what they were paid to do while simultaneously ruining my marriage. I didn't even recognize their voices. I finished packing and decided to leave the building. It turned out that everything I thought I knew wasn't true. The love of my life and my wife was actually neither the love of my life nor my wife. My boss, friend, and mentor actually turned out to be an insignificant piece of s, and my career at Arthur Long Associates turned out to be nothing like I thought it would be. In fact, it was over. My colleagues, whom I thought I could trust, were clearly not worth my spit, let alone my credibility. In a matter of minutes, I had lost everything I held dear, my wife, my future children, my home, and my job. Both of my parents had died before I met Penny. I was an only child, which is why losing Penny was such a big deal to me. She was like that donkey song from years ago, you're the sweetest song I could sing to me, but not now. Not now. I wanted to tell someone, but who? Actually, since I was a day early, I didn't see anyone who might recognize me, so I could escape work and try to figure out how to deal with this storm of s. I booked a room at the local Premier Inn and did a Google search for a good divorce lawyer. Finding the best one had to be done before this bee had a chance. Fortunately, I was able to get an appointment via Zoom almost immediately. Only one local law firm, Pleasant and Pleasant, offered such a service, so I contacted them and spoke to one of their family and matrimonial services associates, one Miss Jane Pleasant. I explained to Miss Pleasant what I knew. She was taking notes, looked at me through the screen, and asked, What do you want, Mr. Porter? I want to divorce her for adultery, but wouldn't we need proof? Hire a private investigator. In the old days, long before my father's time, the only way to prove adultery was to catch the guilty couple in the act, with independent witnesses, photographs, and so on. Things have changed for the better now, thank goodness. Hiring a private investigator is possible, but they are limited by laws governing information gathering. Intercepting mail has always been illegal, and privacy laws have been strengthened to include phone tapping, email hacking, and the like. We use the services of a local detective, a former police officer. His name is Jeff Lithgow, and he runs a company called Detective Investigations. If you'd like, we can handle all of this for you. He won't do anything questionable or illegal, but if you need to find evidence, Jeff will provide it for you. But as someone once said, what a price to pay for peace of mind. I agree with her opinion, but I still needed to know how much I would have to shell out. I'll email you the cost of filing the divorce papers, but don't worry, we'll sort it out ourselves. It's £600 plus for the government. Jeff's fee is probably £1,000, and our costs will start at £5,000 as a first tranche, but I'll keep you informed of any possible additional fees. However, we are a family law firm, and we try to keep our rates reasonable. Will I need a detective? She paused, then nodded her head. Yes, I would advise you to hire Jeff. We've been working with Jeff since he left the police force to start his own agency, and he's very, very good. Unless your wife suddenly has a guilty conscience and says, yes, honey, I had sex with Tom, Dick, and Harry. I agree to your terms of divorce, then yes, you will need Jeff's help. By the way, do you know who she is having an affair with? If so, how did you find out about it? 
I told her about the conversation I had overheard. It felt good to be able to tell someone what I'd learned. That's enough to start with, she said. However, if you want to charge adultery, you'll need more evidence, and Jeff can hopefully gather the evidence you need. However, there are other things you need to consider. You will almost certainly not want to continue working for your employer under these circumstances, so I would consider filing a claim for constructive dismissal. We are a law firm, which I like to call a full-service firm, so we will be able to handle this side of the case as well. I will forward your information to our labor law department. And if I were you, I'd start preparing the case now. Contact your doctor and take as much sick leave as possible for something like PTSD. I'll start the divorce papers. If you decide to reconcile with your wife, we can easily withdraw the suit. Is reconciliation in effect? I thought for a couple of seconds before answering, no, no way. If what those guys were saying is true and she wants to divorce me and marry Dave Rogers, then I don't see any possibility of reconciliation. She nodded and said, yes, I can understand that. Besides, I'll get your information to Jeff so he can get started. After we finished talking, I called the private physician's office and almost immediately was able to make an appointment via video link. He emailed me a three-month sick leave, blaming PTSD for the hostile work environment and psychological issues. He also sent my pharmacy a prescription for paroxetine to treat PTSD. I forwarded the sick leave to my employer's human resources department. I decided to take the bull by the horns and call Penny. Hello, she answered. Was it just me, or did I detect a hint of suspicion in her voice? What's up, Louis? Are you still planning on coming back tomorrow? To be honest, I'm feeling better. In fact, I'm already back in town. When I got to the office, I overheard two random co-workers talking. They were talking about you and Dave Porter. Turns out Porter is Arthur's nephew. Is it true that you and Porter had a relationship? She gasped and asked, what did you hear? That you've been in a sexual relationship with him for many months, and that you're going to divorce me and marry him. Is that true? She paused for a moment before answering, I wish it hadn't happened, Louis. I wanted to tell you myself, under control and with love. I still have feelings for you, but I love Dave more. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Do you realize that this whole situation sucks so bad that I'm going to have to leave the company? Oh no, why? Because all my colleagues in management know, and apparently Dave got his F Uncle Arthur to send me to Cardiff instead of himself so he could spend his time having fun with you. Did you know about that? No, Louis, I didn't. And if I did, well, I'll have to talk to Dave. He and I should never have brought you into this, humiliating you like that. It was wrong. Maybe so, Penny, but everyone knows that Porter had his uncle get me out of the way to screw you. How many times did that happen? Was Cardiff an isolated incident, or did it happen other times as well? I don't, I don't think so. It was obvious that it had happened, but Penny didn't want me to know what AS she was. Are you coming home? No, I'm not. I'm staying in a hotel for now, and I'll find something more permanent soon. I cut the call short. What to do? Get drunk? Why? What had my mind and body done that I should punish them for what that slut Penny had done? I went to the hotel bar, ate a fairly acceptable burger, drank three pints of Brewdog Punk IPA, and left for the night. The next morning, I called a friend who owns several apartment buildings in our hometown. He arranged to meet for a cup of coffee and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. He offered me a modestly furnished two-bedroom apartment with a construction oversight job attached. We signed the contract, I got the keys, and I moved into the apartment that evening. In the afternoon, I went to the house. Luckily, Slut Penny was at work or having fun with Dave, so I was able to get everything I needed from home, passport, papers, clothes, etc. I was feeling depressed but coped with the help of counseling arranged through my private doctor. I have long since given up on the NHS as a bad job. I have to say that the investigator the solicitors recommended was bloody good. 
He took joint photos and got affidavits from people who knew about the case. It looks like Dave Porter made a lot of enemies in the company who didn't mind getting back at him. I actually wondered if my two anonymous informants had guessed that I worked in the stores and had specifically told me about the affair to bring me up to speed. I guess I'll never know the truth, but I will be eternally grateful to them. I decided to get tested for STDs, but luckily I came up clean. The divorce went through, and my claim for constructive dismissal went through the UK Employment Tribunal system. This system is not as complicated as the normal UK tribunals, they tend to be more flexible. For example, a labor judge, although a judge, never wears wigs or robes. My firm of solicitors introduced me to one of their employment law experts. She was not a solicitor but a lawyer called Karis Morgan. She was Welsh, as her name suggested. In fact, she looked like a young Ruth Maddock who played Gladys Pugh in Hide a High. She grinned and said, I know what you're thinking, and although we're not close relatives, Ruth Maddock is a relative of mine. She calmed me down, prepared me for what would happen at the tribunal. What she couldn't prepare me for was the absolute lowlife that Arthur's representative made of himself. He entered the chamber in full barrister's attire and a wig. I swear when he came in, he smelled faintly of mothballs. The employment judge, Mary Patrick, was quite alarmed, or rather, she was, but she tried not to show it. I assume you represent Arthur Long Associates, she asked. He bowed and replied, yes, your honor. Yes, I'm not your honor. This is a tribunal, not a trial, and wigs and robes are not normal attire here. Please remove your wig. As you wish. He removed the wig. Karis whispered to me, oh, he didn't like that. He's clearly annoyed because he's decided he can use his barrister status to intimidate us mere mortals. I won't bore you with the details, but things went very badly for Arthur Long Associates. E.J. Patrick agreed that if a company owner not only knew that his nephew was having an affair with a colleague but actually condoned the affair by arranging for the husband to be sent instead of the nephew so that he could go out with his wife, then it meant that the employee-employer relationship had broken down irretrievably and that it was a constructive dismissal. The payout I received was £80,000, although I also received redundancy pay, vacation pay, etc. The industry we worked in was small, albeit profitable, and word soon spread about what had happened. It wasn't me, honestly, remember? I'm speechless, right? Eventually, despite his sister's protests, Arthur fired his nephew. The general consensus was that it was too little, too late. He lost several senior staffers because they realized that if he conspired with his nephew and let him screw one of the executive team members, his judgment would now be off the charts. The divorce went through fairly quickly. Evidence from Jeff's company and the evidence used for constructive dismissal was also presented in the divorce case. It was the standard 50-50 split. I was annoyed that Penny was essentially profiting from the fact that she was a whore, but I was free of the whore, so from that standpoint, the case was worth it. I started a home-based consulting firm and took on a few of Arthur's clients, so that wasn't bad. After the money from the tribunal arrived in my bank account, I decided to pluck up my courage, called Karis, and asked her to meet for a drink. To my delight, she agreed. She looked great and surprised me, but in a good way, by ordering a pint of Brains S.A., a Welsh beer. I drank my usual pint of Brewdog Punk IPA but then switched to Brains S.A. Yes, taciturn but not stupid. We chatted as we drank, and it transpired that she was born in a small town in Mid Wales, which is very close to where my grandparents farmed. She took my hand, looked me in the eye, and said, See, I knew there was something special about you, you're an undercover Welshman. We both laughed at our joke. I fell in love with her, and not just because she looked like Ruth Maddock. Over the next few weeks, we dated, going to movies, drinks, and dinner. I invited her to my house for dinner, which I cooked myself. After the meal, over a glass of wine from a Welsh vineyard, I took her hand and told her how I felt about her. She squeezed my hand, smiled, and breathlessly asked, what do you think we should do about it? She looked toward my bedroom door. Well, that certainly came quicker than I dared even hope. I nodded, smiled, and followed. Yes, we made love. 
As corny as it sounds, I felt a deeper, more loving connection with Karis than I had ever felt with Penny during our acquaintance or marriage. In a moment of self-realization, I understood that it was because Penny had never been attracted to me as much as I was to her. Otherwise, she would never have been able to flip from me to Dave Rogers. Karis and I's courtship was slow, warm, and loving. I was late in finding the love of my life with a Welsh fireball. Were we alike because we were both Welsh? Yes, as silly as it sounds, I think there is some truth to it. After a year of knowing each other, we got married and started talking about kids. Karis is teaching me Welsh, and it's a long but fascinating process. We moved to Mid Wales. She got a job at a firm of solicitors in Mackinleth, and I will continue to do consulting from our four-bedroom house near the city center. What about the conversations about having children? Those have been replaced by conversations about what paint to buy for the nursery. We are now two months old and couldn't be happier. Thank you, Penny. Did Penny and Dave get married? I don't know, and I don't really care. I'm the taciturn one.